the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to take a few minutes for anyone who uh, would like to get to the R code uh, on their computer and follow along. I'm going to put some links in the chat um, and show you guys how to um, get that. If I can find the chat really quick, I can't see it. Here it is. Okay, so I'm gonna post some links in the chat for everybody, um, and then we'll explain explain what they are. Actually, uh, sorry, one second. This was not the link I was expecting. Okay. Okay, so this first link here is to the GitHub repository. Um, <clears throat> and as you can see in my screen, I'm going to move this too. So once you click on this link, if you want to use the GitHub repository, uh, in here is some data sets and also the R markdown, uh, which we'll be, we'll be using today. So what you do is, yes, the record, it will be recorded and put on the YouTube channel. So you'll click on this code button at the top here and then download the zip. Um, and you'll get a zip file here that you can then open. And within that, you'll you'll be able to get to the materials. The main two things that you'll want to open in R today is this NAPB experimental designs uh, RMD file, which is an R markdown file. And then we'll also load in this uh, this CS17 G2F uh, R data set. So you can easily do that. Um, for example, if you have R open, you can just click, you should be able to just click and drag them over. If not, you might have to, you might have to load them as well. But um, the other way you can, you can get it is if we go, I also have made a Google Drive for some people, it's easier just to download the documents and open them. So everything in this Google Drive should be, actually, that's not the right link. Oh. Uh, let me get the shared link for you guys. Okay. And you can click on this Google Drive and download the, the R markdown here, the RMD file. And then we'll also need this uh, RDA file here. Um, so I'll give everybody a minute to do that. If you have any questions, let me know in the chat and I'll try to help. And we'll take about five minutes to let people download that data. Oh, sorry, I was sending a private message. I'll send that again to everyone. Okay, there you go. Sorry about that. <laughs> Yeah, so you're gonna want to download the uh, NAPB experimental design. Uh, .rmd. And then the CS17 G2F .rda. Okay, sorry about that again. This keeps going to private chats whenever I type it. So these two files are the ones that you're gonna need. Um, so when you go into when you go into R, you can just say file, uh, open file. And for example, if you're in your downloads or something, you click this, it's about 30 kilobytes and it will open up. So if I close this, And I go to open file and click on this RMD file. You should get this file to come up. And then you can say open another file. And you should be able to open this uh, RDA file. And you can just say yes to this. 
That should have worked. Okay. Open. Okay, well, we'll worry about that in a minute. Don't worry about the CS17. Yeah, you should be you should be opening these in uh, our studio. Yeah, we'll uh we'll not worry about the RDA file for a second. Let's just get the markdown working because uh, the RDA file will be um at the end of the session later on today, so we can take a few minutes. But yeah, good question, DJ. Uh, we're working in our studio, um, so it's just a uh, extension of R where you can work on uh, more. It's a really nice software because you can write in Markdown, which we're using today, uh, which makes data processing very repeatable. And then it's also very clean. And you can also work in Python and other other uh, coding languages in, in uh, our studio. Oh, I can put files in the chat. Um, I guess they have to be, let me see if this will work. No, it's too, we'll just, we'll just let you guys use the, the uh, is anyone uh, having, do you have a download? Yes, you do have to download our studio from online. Um, So rstudio.com. This is where you get our studio. You'll also have to download R if you don't have R installed as well. And I apologize uh, based off the, I was going under the impression that we were um, Here's where you get, uh, R. Okay, so sorry for not prefacing that. Um, we went over that in the last seminar to get set up to be able to use R. So I'm assuming there's a lot of new people here, so it's okay, we'll take a few minutes. Um, the best option for now, if you don't have R in, in installed is to just follow along with the screen. Um, everything here is going to be completely repeatable. So, and it's also being recorded. So you can go back once you get R installed and work through this. We're not going to actually be typing any code in today. I already have all the code written. We're just going to kind of walk through it and talk about uh, how to properly uh, analyze your experimental designs. Okay. So the first thing is, do, were some people successful at getting the uh, markdown to open? Can someone confirm in the chat that they've got the markdown? Okay, we got one thumbs up or thumbs up. Okay, we got a few thumbs up. Okay, cool. So it looks like some people are getting the markdown to work. Um, I guess I can give you a direct link to that so we can get rid of the confusion. Here's the direct link to the markdown if anyone's having trouble getting it to download. That's the exact file that you need. Okay, so uh, also for future reference, if you ever, if, if anything gets changed in here because there's an error, um, the, the if you want to follow along and fix it, that's you can, but I'll be pushing the correct, whatever we do here today up to the GitHub. So the final version will be on the GitHub, not the, not the Google drive. So um, after today, the final version will be housed on the GitHub. Okay, so some of the packages we're gonna be using today. Okay, let's talk about how this Markdown works. So Markdown looks a little different than some of the R you're looking at because uh, it saves it so you can go line by line and you don't even need, you don't need to use the console anymore. It will, it will put the results right below it, kind of like a Jupyter notebook. Um, so it's really nice for teaching and also just for general data analysis so people can follow along with what you're doing. 
So whenever we do a block of code here, you can see it's kind of shaded uh, and it's in these two groups of uh, uh, hyphens. Um, sorry, not hyphens, but quotes. You just press the play button and it will execute everything between these two lines of code. Um, you can also do the traditional control enter and it should, it should ru it'll run your line that you're on if you want to. So we're using a lot of uh, new packages today. Uh, one of the main ones we're gonna be using is LME4, which is linear mixed modeling, uh, ggplot for graphing. Uh, some of these other packages are just necessary to do some of the, the, the tricks, we're, or not the tricks, but some of the processes we're doing. This is CAR. I believe it's for making, uh, adding the uh, connecting letter reports, LS means for extracting uh, least squared means and doing uh, uh, Fisher's test on them, uh, multiple comparison, more tricks for LME4 tests, uh, QQ plots. I guess I just repeated this. Anyways, that, that's not a big deal. Uh, so anyways, we have to install these packages and then we have to pull them into the library. Um, so go ahead and press the play button here and, and we'll start downloading that. And you can see it in your console uh, here that it's working. If you press this button, it'll come up. And it's this might this is gonna take about two or three minutes. Um, LME4 can take a while to install. And again, if anyone has any questions, please put them in the chat and I'll try to answer them to the best of my ability. Um, if you're having issues installing any of the packages, as you see here, warnings are okay. Don't worry about the warnings. Um, especially for me, I, I probably have more warnings than you do. Um, you might have to install the newest version of R that sometimes is the easiest way to fix some of the issues um, or restart R several times. Okay, so mine finished. I'll give everybody a few more minutes. So you'll see up here in the, uh, the R, I mean, in the, in the markdown that it's output some things. Uh, it's just telling you, you know, it requires things that are installed. So we're going to install these for you. Don't worry about any of this. Unless you can see an error, you should be good to go. Have some people completed the, uh, the install? Thumbs up. Okay, Nolan says yes. Got a few thumbs up. Cool. We'll give this another minute or two. Okay, so we're gonna move. We're gonna move on. Um, so we're not. I don't, I'm not sure that this is gonna take the full three hours today, but we have three hours allotted. Um, so just to preference this, the idea today is that everyone here. Uh, has some experience with experimental design. They understand the concepts of how to, to lay out their experiment. Um, and if you don't, there's a lot of really great uh, online resources and books that are available. Um, and there should be, you know, if you're starting your, your graduate career, it's, there should be a, either a course in your statistics department or in your, uh, your agronomy or soil and crop science or your horticulture department that teaches in, in uh, experimental design. Um, I learned from this book here. Uh, it's Designs of Experiments for Agriculture and Natural Sciences by Reza Hosmond. So um, that's what they I was I learned with. And there's also a lot of other books that the people use um, and statistics courses if you really want to get into it. So what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about okay, we have the data collected, we've designed our experiments. How do we get the information that we need to uh, make decisions and uh, write our publications? So we're gonna start with the simplest of designs. It's called the completely randomized design. Um, and all of this in green is notes. So if you wanna add notes and more things to it, uh, 
you can do a, a, a greater than and a space and you can type things in and it will be in, in text form for you and it won't be executed as code. So uh, for all of the ANOVA statistics, there is a few assumptions that we have to keep in mind um, that a lot of people do uh, when they do their analysis, but you don't see it discussed much. You'll talk about it in your courses. Um, just keep these in mind. It does get a little bit more difficult to test these assumptions and keep these assumptions valid when we get into really advanced uh, statistical designs. But for the easy ones, we'll show you how to implement them. And then in the, uh, okay, great. It looks like the chat's working. When we get into the more advanced ones, like split split plots and uh, like mixed models, it becomes a little bit more difficult to answer these questions and you don't, you might have to talk with a, a statistical expert to kind of figure out the most appropriate way to do that. Um, but anyways, so the first assumption is that all of the observations are independent. The second assumption is that the residuals of your model are normally distributed. So a lot of people, when they test normality, they forget that it's not the norm that your data is normal, it's that the residuals of the model you run is normal. Uh, QQ plot. Yeah, there's no R at the end of the QQ plot. That might be the issue. Um, Yeah, it worked for me. Uh, you might need to, yeah, sorry. So yeah, QQ plotter. So thanks, there's an error there. Um, there, yeah, these notes will be all, all of this mesh will be available on online and, and the video will be available online. So yeah, I fixed this here on line 32. There was an R there and there shouldn't be an R. So um, interesting, okay. Don't worry about it. Well, QQ plotter should work, but um, GG plot. Okay. Yeah, there's a the notes link. Okay, one second here. Here's the, uh, again, here is the Google Drive to the R Markdown where you can download it. Okay, so there's, let's, let's not uh, get caught up with all of this right now. Um, this is something that it can be tricky depending on your uh, version of R and also um, if you have certain things and you might have to ha install uh, more things. So I, I apologize if some of these aren't working. Um, again, we can still follow along and you can go back and try to figure out the issue on, on your end later on installing a package. It does, it does become complicated sometimes where you need to restart R and install R tools and do some things, but for today, as long as uh, no one is having a huge issue installing LME4, that's the one, the one that we're going to be using a lot today. Um, so let's just get, let's get back here. So let's let me start over with the completely randomized design again. So again, assumptions that the independent observations. Yeah. Okay. The R is necessary. Uh, we'll show a way to to create QQ plots without the QQ plot the, uh, uh, package too. So, um, so the assumptions that are that the, that the observations are independent um, and you can get into, this becomes invalid later on if you do uh, repeated uh, 
time series data, but we're not going to talk about that today. Uh, so what I was getting at before was that the nor the normally distributed residuals. So a lot of people want to check the normality on their on their data, but the correct way to do it is to fit your model, extract your residuals, and then test normality on your residuals. Um, that's the true correct way to test for normality in your data. So you can have completely unnormal data, but once you run your uh, your mixed model, for example, you can you can end up with uh, normally distributed residuals because the model accounts for a lot of things and uh, takes error out of certain areas. Um, and the last thing is that each population of your data has to have equal variance. So this one is uh, sometimes difficult to, once you get into more advanced designs, uh, checking that each individual has an equal variance can become very complicated. And this is the one where I'm, where I was saying that you need to kind of think this through. Uh, and we're gonna, we're not gonna really touch on it too heavily in the more advanced designs. Um, but, but just keep that in mind that you should test for equal variances um, of your populations. And we'll show that in the simple designs and we won't get into it and the advanced designs because it gets a lot more complicated and uh, and computationally time consuming to do. Um, so some of the advantages of the completely randomized design is it's simple. It's, it's the simplest design that exists. Uh, it avoids making uh, dubious statistical assumptions. So the assumptions are very easy to, to keep in mind and they're very easy to test. Uh, it's, there's not a lot of violations of the assumptions and the analysis is very simple. So the major disadvantage of the completely randomized design is that it's, it lacks accuracy and inefficient, inefficiency to precisely estimate your treatment effects. So there's a lot of error and a lot of, uh, of very low accuracy in your, in your estimated means of your output. Um, and the main thing that you're doing in these, these designs is you're testing if the decision, if the between group variability is larger than the within group variability to reject the null hypothesis. Okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna talk about this, uh, this data set that comes out of the book that I just showed you. So um, this is, we're calling this data set vitamin and don't worry about what this is. I'm just creating, a, I'm creating a data frame here. Uh, and we discussed how to do that in the previous R workshop. So if you wanna learn what all of this is, go back and review creating data frames. So we're gonna create a data frame called vitamin. Uh, sure, I'll, I'll do that later on once we get through some of this. Auden, I'll go ahead and get that, give that for you. Um, but there's a lot of other books too. This is a very classical old school book that teaches you how to uh, calculate sum of squares and calculate mean square error and calculate F statistics. So it's a very, uh, it's, it doesn't have R code or anything in it. I don't even think it has SAS code in it. So there's, there's actually books nowadays that are more modern with SAS and R code in them. Um, so the two things that we're doing here as well is we're, we're going to make the treatment and the replicate factors, which makes them groups instead of either numeric or characters. Yes, there it is. Thank you, Danielle. Um, and then we'll just go ahead and press the play on this. Let me get this out of the way again. So, and then we ask for the head. And what the head does is it shows us the first five rows of the data table so we can look at it. So if we scroll down, we can see a treatment. So we have five treatments of A, five replicates, and then their weight gain in kilograms. So, sorry, I did not uh, explain this. Uh, so this, this data set is a, so we're gonna have some animal science data sets and, some, and some, some crop data sets here. So this is a study of vitamin supplementation randomly assigned to five uh, heifers, which are cows. And then they were looking at the weight gains associated with that. So there's uh, there's eight different uh, diets and five replicates or five heifers with those diets. 
And if we go to line 83 and we press play here for summary, we can see that summarized here that we have uh, these different treatments with five and then we have eight replicates of each treatment, I mean, five replicates of the eight treatments and then the weight gain in, in numeric values. So this is just simple statistics to look at your data set to make sure nothing crazy is going on. Like you only have four observations of the third rep um, or you only have, which would mean you're missing some data. Uh, if you want to see the whole data set, you can use this view function. And if you execute this, you'll open another screen and you'll, you'll be able to see the full data set here if you want to scroll through it and look at it. So if you want to see the data sets moving forward, um, you can do that. Also, if you make sure that this in this right screen here, if you're clicked on environment, you can see everything that we're loading into the environments. And uh, you can just click on them there as well if you would like to, to view them. If it has to be under list. So if I click this now with this as list, I can just pull it up too. Okay, any questions? Is everybody able to follow along pretty well here? Okay, so the next step that I, I like to do is, so we're, we're, we're still essentially loading the data in, right? We, we're talking about what the structure of the data is. Um, it's just eight treatments and five replicates. That's, that's how a completely randomized design works. And technically the replicates are not even in, in blocks. They're just, rent. for example, these are cows. They're just walking around the field, right? They're not spatially blocked or anything. So using the replicate is, is solely just for data structure purposes um, to keep track of which one's which. Okay, so the next thing that I like to do is I always like to look at your data. So um, this is just a built-in command called strip chart. Um, if you build it, you can see the, the points by the treatments. So each diet and then where the weight gain values are. Um, so we can see here, we have some, some diets with very, very uh, low variance across the, tr the, uh, the, the readings. And then we have other diets where we have very big variance in the, uh, in the, in the values we collected. Uh, another way we can look at this is with box plots. Uh, and here's how you would do that with a box plot. Uh, and we can see here again, you know, we have, we can see that in D, these could potentially be outliers of the data set because the, they're so stretched across the, uh, the collection of data. So these are nice. Um, these are the classical plots for R. Uh, the only thing with these are is they, they're not extremely visual, visually appealing. So if you're trying to publish in a, in a journal, um, you can use these but they're just, uh, they're not as nice as if you go ahead and start using some things like a GG plot and we can add some color and then we can adjust uh, a lot. We can have a lot more uh, freedom to adjust our, our charts. So for example, if we wanted to remake this strip chart in GG plot, it's fairly easy. Uh, how GG plot works is you put in the data set and they use this thing called aesthetics. And this is the X value, this is the Y value. And then you can use these arguments such as color, fill, shape. There's a lot to it. Um, we, we can spend a whole three hours talking about ggplot. Um, and then you can add other things like geometric point, which tells it to add the points. And this is just another feature to make it look nice. So if we press play on that, we get this really nice looking graph. We could go into even more detail and we can change change the font size, the font color and all these things in here, but we're not going to do that today. Um, again, uh, you can make the box plot and I would say this looks a lot better for a publication than that than this grayed out, especially with all the publications being uh, 
virtual nowadays and not having to worry too much about color versus grayscale. Um, GG plots are great to, to make your, your plots visually appealing and really make the different groupings stand out by their colors. Okay, any questions, concerns? This is just quick data uh, visualizations. Box plots are really great for that. We'll use some histograms later, uh, depending on the data size. The groupings are small enough here where we can use box plots. But for example, if you're talking about a, a, a grain yield variety trial in maize with 350 hybrids, you wouldn't be able to make box plots of 350 hybrids easily. Okay, so it doesn't look like we have any questions. Let's run the model. So we're going to do a classical ANOVA analysis for this. Um, and there's several reasons for that. Uh, first off, we can't run REML with this model because there is no random effect. And REML, there's essentially no reason to use REML unless you have a random effect in your model. Um, and it's simple enough that we can use classical ANOVA and, and pull an ANOVA table out, uh, which a lot of people are still like to see because that's how they learned to uh, interpret their models. So this AOV function is analysis of variance. And we're just assigning that to a CRD object. So you would say your response variable, which is weight gain dot kilograms, equals, so in, in models, we use a tilde, uh, your, your treatment effect. And then we tell it the data. And so what by telling it the data, we don't have to say vitamin dollar sign weight gain. It, it can go in and, and read the, uh, the column names. And then we're just going to summarize the, the model after it's been completed and fitted. So we'll go ahead and play, play that. Okay, so this is where we'll see our classical um, ANOVA table. Um, and this is this is what you would present in, in your findings. So we can see that uh, the p-values here, if you like p-values, um, some people in statistics are moving away from p-values, but a lot of specifically reviewers still wanna see the statistical p-value behind your your treatment effect. So here we're highly significant, so it, that means there are differences in the diets. Um, so this is where we need to now stop and go back and start uh, evaluating our assumptions of the model and, and to ensure that what we're doing here, what we're interpreting here isn't skewed by non-normality or, or uh, other assumptions in the model. So we can use the simple plot feature. And since we used AOV, the plot feature will then knows that it's an AOV uh, model fit and it will give us outputs such as QQ plots. It will give us outputs such as uh, homogeneity of variance plots. So it, it will actually give us four plots. So if I take away the switch for a second and run it, you'll see that we get four different plots that come out. But I am just putting the which because we want to look at normality first. And we can plot the QQ plot, which is the statistical res residuals against the theoretical quantiles. And if uh, you're not familiar with how QQ plots work, the idea is, is that the, the dots should run along the line. And when you see uh, big uh, deviations from the line, that's when you have uh, indications that there's non-normality in your data. So it depends on how uh, this is up for interpretation and it's up to the, the to whoever is running, whoever's interpreting the model. But for example, to me, this looks fairly normal. Uh, some people would say that these may be causing non-normal non-normality. Um, so it's, it's kind of, you know, person to person's opinion, what is, no, what's normal when you're looking at a QQ plot. Um, usually unless I see like a huge sigmoidal kind of deviation, I, I'm not terribly worried about 
these small blips off of the line. Um, but if you were to see huge, huge deviations, some of the ways you can resolve that are by transforming your data and then running your model again and seeing if the transformed model uh, has more normal residuals. Uh, you could also, if you have huge leveraging points, for example, like if this 18 was way up here, you may want to uh, investigate to see if that's an outlier and that should be removed um, from the data set. Um, those are the two, you know, outlier removal. And then, you know, the worst, the worst case scenario is, is you start removing big chunks of the data for, to create normality. I wouldn't recommend that. Um, and then as one of my teachers always said, you can, if worse comes to worse, you can just ignore it and move forward. You, I wouldn't, I would try to do your best before you get to that last stage, but sometimes you need, you need to move forward with analyzing your data. So you have to, you can't get stuck on normality and homogeneous variances for too long. Okay. Um, we can also make a histogram of the residuals to see, you know, so what we mean by normality is that it should follow a normal distribution, uh, mean zero. And, and this looks pretty good. Um, this, this is again up for interpretation. This is where this gets a little difficult. So you can, there are statistical tests to test the residuals fit normal. Uh, one of the most common ones is called the Shapiro-Wilkes test of normality. And what it's going to do is it's going to, it's going to test this null hypothesis that the, that the residuals are normally distributed. So if the P value is below your, your 0.05, you would say it's not normally distributed. So if we, if we run this, for example, we can see our p-value is greater than our cutoff. So this would tell us, this is a statistical test that says our residuals are normally distributed. Um, and again, with, with a lot of these tests, they, they work to an extent. And once you, there's always, you know, different things that happen with these, especially when you get into really large sample sizes some of these tests are really uh, biased by, by the sample size. Uh, for example, I remember when I was doing my PhD work, if you tried to do the Shapiro-Wilkes test on a, on a sample size of like several thousand, it's always not normal. Um, but even though you would look at the QQ plot and it looks great. So keep that in mind. Um, but if someone asks you to give them a p-value for normality, this is one way you could do it. Okay, so as far as, so the assumptions go, we know that the data is independent. Um, I think there's ways to test that, but usually you should know that based on your experimental design and how you're collecting your data. Um, we know that the data is now normally distributed, the residuals are, and the last assumption is we have to test for equal variances of the populations. So the populations in this, and this data set are the diets. So this is uh, one way you can visualize that. Um, this is the residuals versus the fitted values. And essentially what you're looking for is this, this red line to be straight. Um, but we can see a little blip here, but it's not too bad. Now, the way that you usually learn how to do this in a statistics course is uh, using the Levine's test. Um, and the Levine's test is similar to the, uh, the Shapiro-Wilkes test in that you're testing that the variances are equal. And if, if, you, re if you reject that, that means the variances are not equal. Uh, so it's kind of opposite of some, some statistical tests where you're testing that they're not. Okay, we'll just leave it there. Don't want to confuse you guys. So if we run the Levine's test, since the p-value is greater than 0.05, we would say that the variances of the populations are equal. So we are, the assumption is valid. Okay, so base, by doing this, now we can say that our model assumptions are met. Um, and we can move forward with the, the model that we ran up here 
and, and saying that the, there are differences in the treatments. We've shown that the model assumptions are met and now we can move forward with looking at the statistical differences of these diets. So we're now here at line 162. Sorry, I'll, I'll scroll, I'm gonna scroll around a lot and I'll try to remember to come back to where we're working at. So what we're doing here is we're calculating the, the uh, least squared means. Um, so we use this function called LS means. And then you put your model in and you say, I want LS means by the treatment effect. So if we do that, what we'll get out is we'll, we'll get our LS means out here for each treatment. We'll get our standard errors. Our... Is there a question? Somebody's unmuted. Um, so we'll get our lower 95 confidence interval and our upper 95 confidence interval. Um, and this is kind of the data you will use. This is the data you would use to, per, to make inferences about which one is better than the other. So the, the only thing with this right now is it's ordered by the treatments and it's kind of hard to interpret because uh, they're not in any specific order. You could either order this um, and we'll sh I'll show you how to do that later. But if you're, if you're in uh, a lot of, you know, agriculture based uh, research practices, people want to see the connecting letter reports. Um, but this, it really isn't that common outside of agriculture and, uh, and animal science. So there are functions that do it in R. The nice thing about uh, JMP as well is the JMP does it really efficiently. So sometimes uh, if, if I really need connecting letter reports, I'll, I'll go run the model in JMP as well. Um, but for the purposes of today, I'll, this, this, the, th the problem with this function, the CLD function is, is it works great on small data sets, but once you get into really big treatments that are hundreds of, of uh, there's hundreds of treatments, it, it bogs down, it takes hours to run. Whereas in jump, it only takes a couple of minutes. Um, so if anybody wants to create a, or knows a better way to do connecting letter reports, uh, please let me know, or if there's a computer scientist in here who wants to make a more efficient function in R, that'd be great. <laughs> Anyways, so what we're doing here is we're calling the CLD function. We're saying take our, our LSDs, our least squared differences, uh, and then we're just saying assign letters to them and order it in decreasing values. So if we run that, we now have the uh, treatments ordered by their LS means. And we now have these groupings on the right of these letters, which is what a lot of classical agriculture and agronomists and plant breeders like to see. It makes it easy to identify where the significant difference occurs. Um, so for anyone who's not familiar with connecting letter reports, basically what it shows is that everything that contains an A in its grouping is statistically the same, and everything that's B is statistically the same, and only, so only these two and these three are grouped far enough apart to be st statistically different from the other. So F and C are statistically different from E, A, and B. Um, and you can see that, we'll, uh, we'll show you that in a second through the, the confidence intervals. Um, any questions? Good, this is, so if you have any questions, please ask because once we start going, we're gonna, we're not gonna spend as much time explaining everything and we're kind of just gonna go through the process um, and show the outputs, just so you guys have an idea of how to run these models correctly in R. Okay, so this, this is just a, uh, a housekeeping thing that, that you have to do for, for plotting. Um, and we're not gonna go into detail about this, just execute this code. What it's doing is it's ordering, it's reordering the factor uh, order so that when you 
make the GG plot, it looks, it's, it's built correctly. Um, and we can talk about this later if there's extra time and someone wants to know what's going on there. So we're just going to make another plot. I'm giving you guys some simple examples of, of, of GG plots in case you want to just make a quick, easy GG plot for your research. So again, we're using, we're using this LS means table that we built here with the connecting letters. And we're using the treatment column as the X and we're using the LS means as the Y and we're going to fill the bar graphs by the treatment label. Um, so this means make bar graphs and we have to use this equation called stat equals identity so that it knows to use the value rather than a summation. Uh, if you don't have this, it would give you an error because we only have one value for each treatment. Uh, we're gonna make error bars with the confidence intervals. Uh, so you could do this with the standard error too if you want. I like to use the confidence intervals. I think it's more appropriate and interpretable in my opinion. Uh, so lower, lower CL, upper CL, right? Uh, and these are just some, just to make it look nicer. And then we're gonna add this, this comment called geometric text. And we're going to say label equals these, these labels here, these, these dot, I mean, not these letters, sorry. Uh, so the trick, the trick with this geometric text to add the, the, the connecting letters is, is you have to tell it to get, to give, you know, X locations, but this has to be one through the number of treatments. So we have eight treatments, so it has to be one through eight. You could say n, you could say one to you know n row your your data if you wanted to. Um, like n row LSD, and this should this should work as well. Uh, and then we're saying put the put the the letters uh, 0.5 values above the upper confidence interval. Uh, and these are just some more housekeepings. You can look into these if you want. We're just changing the Y label, changing the way the theme looks and disabling the legend because we don't need it in this case. Okay, so, okay, so I was wrong. You can't, you can't use the N row here. Uh, it might be, we're not gonna dive into that. Let's just stick with the eight. So if we do eight, we get this really nice graph ordered in ascending order. So that's what this this did here that we didn't talk about. I told it to put the, the, the treatments in order from lowest to highest so that the graph looks really nice and easily interpretable. So as we can see here, the confidence intervals should line up with the, with the values. So everything with an A, all the confidence intervals should overlap at some point, and all the confidence intervals with a B should overlap at some point, and the ones with only A or only B should not overlap. Um, this doesn't necessarily hold true if you use uh, other uh, comparison models such as two keys, but it does work for Fitchers, and it, it still works for pretty well for two keys. Okay. Um, I don't see any questions. Any questions? Any hand raises wants to verbally ask a question before we move on. This this is a, essentially where you would be done with a completely random model. You've got your your LS means out, and you can make your interpretations. That you know, if you really wanted to, you could run Duncan's comparing the control to each one of the treatments. But um, it's pretty obvious that. All of these are statistically the same as the control and F and C are the only ones that statistically increase weight per kilogram. No questions? Okay, if you have a question, please remember to just raise your hand or, or, or put it in the chat, please. Okay, so we're gonna move on to something that is more widely used. It's probably the most widely used 
Actually, let me make one more comment here. So one of the other things that I don't necessarily like about uh, CLD, CLD function is that um, they only, it always groups from lowest LS mean to highest, whereas in, uh, in JMP and uh, I think SAS as well and like and uh, AS Reml, they 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 label from the highest to the lowest. So the A would be the the A would be down here, um, and I think that's that's just my personal preference. But it doesn't really make much of a difference. Um, and if you really want to make your graphs look good, they have these blank values in here. So you'd have to go in and and manually delete the spaces that are created to keep the the letters lined up. So that each each one of these would be directly over the uh, the confidence interval. Those are just quirks of someone who's done this for a long time, and you know it's it's an annoyance to have to go in and do that. So um, just just food for thought there. Okay, so let's move on to the completely randomized design, uh, randomized complete block design here. I'm sorry. Uh, so this is probably the most widely used experimental design period. Um, if you have the room to do it, uh, it's the, probably the best one to use uh, for simplicity reasons and also accuracy. So um, we'll talk a little bit about how this works. So what you do is you, you put your, instead of having randomization all over your experiment, you have your, you have your reps in blocks. And your blocks uh, are, are spaced throughout the field to go with the variation. So for example, if you have high variation from the front to the back of the field, you would put your blocks in, in order from front to back. So block one would be at the front, block two would be at the back, this behind it, and block three, so on. If your variation is really high from left to right, you would probably want your blocks to be from left to right, and you'd have them go all the way to the field, and then you put them side by side. So look into that a little bit more detail if you've never made an RCPD. Uh, that's an important concept of it is that you should know the, the gradient of the variation of your trial space and design your blocks accordingly. Um, so just some comments here. The blocks in statistical terms are groups of experimental units that are formed such that the units within the blocks are homogeneous as possible. So that's why you want to group them in areas not across the variance gradient, but closer together, and then put the blocks across the variance. Uh, so this is a, a statistical technique to identify and control variation among groups of experimental units. Uh, the blocking is a restriction on randomization. So the randomization has to be within the block, not across the blocks. So you randomize each block. Um, and each level of a treatment appears once in each block. And each block has to contain all of the treatments. So this can be, this, this is uh, critical for a randomized complete block design. There are also randomized incomplete block designs that are not used as much. And I know I put in the announcement that we would talk about uh, randomized incomplete box, but I left it out today because it's just, more information than I think we need to cover. If you want, if you want to go back and cover that, re reference one of these experimental design books and take a look at it. But I don't know many people that use incomplete blocks if they don't have to. Okay, so the advantages of randomized complete blocks are the accuracy of the results are greatly increased. Um, the flexibility of the design, uh, we can now account for missing data. And again, the statistical analysis is, is simple and straightforward. Okay, so let's talk about the next data set here. Um, so this is a, a corn yield data set of six fertilizer application methods with three replica, replicates, so three blocks. Um, and this is just the data here. We'll run this and we'll look at it. So this is essentially uh, block one, block two, and block three. So commonly 
uh, it's interpreted that if someone says they're running on a randomized complete block design, the rep is the block and that you're just the people know the, the experimenter know has done the blocking correctly. Um, but if you do see a replicate like this, it is the block, the blocking factor. Okay. So let's summarize the data here. And we can see we have three replicates of each one of the fertilizer application treatments. And then we have six fertilizer application treatments per, per replicate. And we have a distribution of grain yield bushel per acre from 130 to 173. Uh, so the data, the data is good. Um, let's take a look at it again. So this is again, just a, a geometric box plot. We can see we have a very good distribution of data, no major outliers to be seen here. Um, so we're, we're just gonna kind of cruise through some of this because this just kind of becomes second nature when you, when you go through this data. Um, so we're going to do a few things here just to kind of show why a randomized complete block is better than a completely randomized design. Um, so we're going to run a completely randomized design quickly uh, and look at the ANOVA table. So what we're saying here is AOV again, grain yield, bushels per acre, and the uh, treatment effect here and the data set is fertilizer placement. So we can see that in a completely randomized design, we have significant treatment differences. Um, so what we wanna look at here and what we wanna explain what, 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 how we're increasing the accuracy of the experiment is by this error residual mean square. So by reducing the error residual, we're increasing the accuracy or the estimates of our experiment. So if we run the RCBD ANOVA, where we now have treatment plus replicate in the model, we can see that we've, we've reduced our residual mean square error and we've actually placed some of that un... Uh, the unexplainable variance into a factor of replicate, which will increase our our understanding of the treatment because there's less noise in the in the in the data. So we can see here now that we've we've partitioned some of the variance into into replicate um, out of and out of and we we know that it's coming out of the residual variance because we our mean square of treatment hasn't changed. Um, you can see our statistical value, p-value has increased though, and our, 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 our f-value has changed. So those, those things do happen, but we did not change the variance in our, in our treatment. Okay, so we're going to show this, we're going to kind of step in, we're going to step away from the analysis of variance realm, and we're going to step into the uh, REML realm, the restricted maximum likelihood um, because it's just more efficient and it's becoming more widely used than the classical ANOVA. And also because when, to, when you get into the more advanced designs, it, it's a lot easier to, to do the analysis than to having to tell these old, these old ANOVA based methods how to calculate uh, error terms and things like that. So when we use LME4, LMER is the, the true function name. The package is LME4. We would say grain yield equals, and for the example of a completely randomized design, because we're going to show what we just did below up here uh, in REML now. So we have to have we have to have a random term in in REML, or else it won't execute. So we make things random by putting them in, in parentheses and leading the factor with a one and a, a bar. And this bar is the key above your enter key where you press shift and that, and then that key. So it's the, it's the backslash key, but holding shift while you press it. Um, and this tells LME, 
R that this is a random effect. So if we want to run this now, we get a definitely a, a very different uh, model output. We get the formula of the model. Uh, it's also telling us that it's using uh, Satterwaite method to calculate the p values. Um, and this is a this is a fa something that comes with the summary function and why we've installed uh, the LME R test package because the the LME R, LME four uh, developers actually don't give you p values for fixed or random effects of Remel models um, because there's a lot of ways you can do it and there's no and there's a lot of reasons why and why not some say certain ones are good and other ones say they're they're biased to type one error and they're biased to sample size so um and we'll discuss that in a minute but for now let's just go over uh so we have our convergence value here we can see the scaled residuals uh, this is the random effects table. So these are your variance components. Uh, so if you're doing... Yes, the, it's, it's available, Dallas. It's re being recorded. Um, it'll be on the YouTube channel. Um, so yeah, so this is where you would do variance decomposition if you ran your whole model as random. You can see 96... 0.73 variance and 52.2. So you can sum these and divide by the total and get a percent variance. Um, and then in this case, we have a fixed effect term of just the intercept uh, that you can, you can interpret how you would like if you want to take in the p-values. Uh, so let's do this with the RCBD method where we have the replicate included now. And we're just going to run that as well. So the models are still built the same way. We just have new kind of features that we add in for LMER to, to evaluate fixed and random effects. You can do this in other packages like uh, NLME, I think, uh, which is nonlinear model modeling. Um, and you can, and you can, you can see those things as well there uh, if you want to use that. But Remel is pretty, I mean, LME4 is pretty widely used in the community. So the main thing we're going to look at here is just the random effects term. Um, and we can see again that we, we went from, um, from 52, variance of 52, down to 44. But we've also put some of that variance into the replicate. and We've actually increased some variance in our treatment as well. So um, we've, we've, partitioned the variance better into these into these these effects um, by including the replicate into into the model whereas before it would have just been noise that we can't account for in the model so let's now run this so you could you could keep your model like this and it and extract uh, what, what are called blups um, but that's dependent on if your treatments are really random or if they're fixed. And this can become a very big discussion if you're not, if you want to go down that rabbit hole. Um, the thing with having your treatments as random is, is that blups will constrict your means to, they'll constrict the means so they'll be closer together. Whereas when they're uh, fixed, they're not as constricted when you extract blues. Yes, Dennis, the, the data sets are in are built into the the script. So we're we're building the data sets right here. So when we when we right below these hashtag data sets, this is the data set. So you just have to execute this code and it will build the 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 data sets we're using. There's only one data set at the end that we'll get into. Okay. That you have to load in. Okay, so Let's run the, this is, so this would be the way that we're actually going to run the model for, for analyzing the data. I was just teaching, kind of showing you guys here theoretically why an RCBD would be better than a completely random model by, by blocking the variation in the field.
Um, so in this case, by not including the parentheses in the one bra in the one bar, we're saying this is a fixed treatment effect, and we have random replicates, which in theory is the correct way to do it because replicates should always be random. Your treatment should always be assigned to replications randomly. Uh, okay, so if we run this, what do we get out of here? Uh, the main thing on this page is, is we can see our random effects table, um, which is not very use. It doesn't really give us much information here. Uh, we can we can pull some more information from this later, and we'll talk about it later once we get into uh, the mixed model where we actually care more about the random effects. Um, but for this case, we're, we're, not really, we're not really concerned with the replicate variance. Um, we just don't want it to be extremely high because then there's, uh, that would indicate that there's large variance in your replicates, across your replicates, which could be a bad thing. Or it could be okay if, if you know your field. Um, so we can use this function now, ANOVA. So what this is doing is it's, it's going to try to build us an ANOVA table of the fixed effects using uh, classical to give us p-values. So if you need p-values for your fixed effects, this is a way you can do it. Um, and this is using uh, Satterwaith, I'm pretty sure, is how it's running it. And it, yeah, it will tell you. So it's calculating p-values by using type three analysis of variance with Satterwaith methods. So we can change this to other things. You can use Kenward, Kenward Rogers if you want, uh, and I'll show examples of that later. Uh, there's also other approaches, um, and this is this is a great. We were talking about this earlier. Actually, let's not get ahead of ourselves. I'm sorry. Dennis is asking, did you make everything random in the LME4 command? Uh, Yes, so on on the line 274, I showed an example of running it fully random, uh, just so you can do variance component decomposition. And then I on 282 is the actual uh, model, which I would recommend you would run for this type of data, where your treatment is fixed and your replicate is random. Um, and, that, and we're moving forward. We're moving forward with the the model of fixed treatments and random replicates. So, this uh, once we do this ANOVA table again, if you if you need your p value, um, for example, I would use this if I've if I have a reviewer that requests p values in my publication, I would you know run this analysis and put the two stars next to it too. Um, if you if you need if you need that, I usually look at all of my um, variables regardless of the statistical importance. Um, this can be useful too if you have a really large factorial and you want to remove uh, parts of your model that aren't significant or have variance of essentially zero. Um, so. Like we were talking about this before, there's there's pros and cons of calculating p-values in linear mixed models, um, and this this question mark function here will open up a a discussion. So if you're interested in learning different ways that you can that you can approach this, and this is uh, this is recommendations by the uh, developers of LME4 uh, as to if you really want to do uh, p-values ways that they would recommend doing it in an order of least recommended to most recommended. Uh, and we'll talk about a few of these later on. Okay, so if we want to extract the the blups, right? We want, I mean, the blues, these are blues. So the only difference between blues and blups, there's statistical calculation differences, which we don't need to go, to, go into theory about that, but Blues are from fixed effects and blups are from random effects. Uh, so if we use this fix effect function, we can pull out the, the blups for grain yield. Um, so what we get here is the actual uh, blues. So you'll get your intercept and then these deviations from the intercept. 
The problem with these is that this is great and you can use these if you're doing something like a QTL analysis or uh, just trying to make decisions on which one's greater or less. But if you're actually trying to present this in a, in a paper or at a conference, this is not very interpretable as far as grain yield goes, like negative 19.3 and two, that, that's not really what's going on. It's actually, uh, you know, broadcast is actually 159 plus two. So you have to either do something like this below where you add the intercept to everything and we get what's called eblups. So eblups are the actual interpretable data with the intercepts and other things added. And this becomes really complicated when you get into really mix, really big interaction models because there's a lot more than just adding the treatment blue to the intercept. Um, you can do it by hand, but it's gonna take a very long time. And luckily these LS means functions um, that are in R and also the ones that you would use in jump to pull out LS means are, are doing this calculation for you, especially in those really advanced interaction terms. So we can see here, this would be what we would want to have as our, our, our true E blues. Um, and we're not talking about lowercase E blues. This is capital E. Um, and this is just the way I learned it when I took statistics. So there might be a more appropriate name for this because um, there's now expression blues, which we won't get into, that are not the same. Um, so we can use the LS means function again and do what we did before where we have the model fit and then say we and we want to pull out the treatments and we're just going to go ahead and run the 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 connecting letter report at the same time so what we get out now is we get the the e blues and the connecting letters for the different fertilizer application methods and we can see here it's rounded but for example control 140 treatment control 140, right? So it's doing the math for us. It's not giving us back negative 19.3. Okay, so um, I think, and then we can, we can run this and pull out the blobs as well. So I think I accidentally deleted the normality testing here um, or did I did I just miss it yeah so I apologize I, I didn't put the normality testing in here um, but I think it's in the next section you would just follow the same procedures as you did before um, I can put one let me put one in here and we'll see if we can do this really quick so we'll just do the Uh, we'll just do the plot of the function. And this should give us the QQ plot. Nope, it's not going to. Uh, Okay, we'll just, let me see if I can pull it for you really quick down here. I, it should be in here. Okay, I have to adjust this really quick. So I'm, I apologize. Uh, again, I will send the, the, uh, the updated script to the, the GitHub for everyone. So, All right, I just need to look at a few things here really quick. Okay, so what I'm saying here is I want to 
add a column called residuals to my initial uh, data frame. Um, and then we just use this residuals function and it will do that. Um, then we can do Sorry about that. We'll just do this quick, uh, this quick thing to do the QQ plots. We'll move forward. Okay. So this is how you would make a QQ plot and GG plots. Um, again, everything looks pretty normal. Uh, and we could also run a Shapiro Wilkes test here. Do first placement. And so, yes, the data is normal. Um, and we can also run really quickly the just going to find it again. I'm run the Levine's test too. So we got ahead of ourselves here. I'm, I apologize because we didn't we didn't uh, I didn't realize that this got erased. So after we do this 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 time, we we probably won't be running the uh, the 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 assumption tests anymore and we'll we'll just assume that you guys can kind of can work on that on your own. Okay, so again, test of homogeneity of a, a variance. Uh if the p value is greater than 0.05, so the variances are equal across the treatments groups, treatment populations. So this is saying we could go back and you know our, our model assumptions are met and our we can we can interpret our model. Okay, um, we could take a few minute break um, if, ever, if anybody wants to, or should we keep going? Okay, let's take a, let's take a, a let's come, let's take like a seven minute break and be back at 2.30 if that's okay. Um, and we'll we'll be back in seven minutes, use the bathroom, and then we'll move on to factorials and split plots. And hopefully if we have time, we'll do a, a yield mixed model multi-location introduction. Um, Alexa, I'll have to look and see. Um, I don't know them off the top of my head. I know they exist, but most of my statistical courses where I learned this were uh, not textbook based. It was, you know, the statistician teaching us through through scripts and uh, and just just examples as, as we're doing here. Um, I know there's probably a few with with some SAS based um, coding built in. I have to go and kind of try to find them. Uh, I would just honestly refer to Google a lot. Uh, Overstack, Stack Overflow is really nice. Uh, the JMP SaaS community has a lot of really good examples. And uh, if you're running a mixed model in Jump, it's it's running Reml. Uh, most of the time, unless you tell it not to. If you put a random effect in your model, it, it will run a Remel based model just like this. So um, it, you just have to take, you know, if you find an example in JMP, look at how, with what's random and what's fixed and just build it into your model here. Um, That's that's honestly, there's some great, 
there's a lot of great R based textbooks that are open source too. Um, I don't know if there's one specifically for experimental designs in in agriculture. There might be some also in the, uh, the AS Reml examples. If you you can go read some of the AS Reml based literature and kind of try to bring that over into LME four if you want. Um, it's just a matter of converting the the coding to the L, the LME four coding as far as defining interactions and defining uh, fixed and random effects. Um, DJ, it will be uh, recorded and then put on the NAPB YouTube page. Wow, thoughts on Proctomix and SAS versus using LME4. Uh, yeah, I, I learned how to use Proctomix when I first did all of this when I when I, when I took the course, um, I personally just am not a big fan of of SAS in general, um, just because of the the lack of user interface. If I'm going to have to type in script, I'm going to do it in R. Um, and also, if if it's simple enough and not too computationally demanding, I'll just run it in Jump because Jump just spits everything I need out right away. Um, the nice thing about R2 is that you can loop through data sets, so you can just run it and forget about it, um, which I really like. I think you could do that in SAS too, but um, yeah, ProcMix is, is great. Um, I think it's, I mean, SAS can get bogged down too if you put big data sets in SAS. So um, when you get into really big data sets, you either got to turn it on and let it run and chug away or you have to look into other options such as AS Rental. Um, that's probably one of the better optimized rental based softwares on the market, but you got to pay for it, unfortunately, unless your institution has copies of it. The nice thing about AS Rental too is that it, there is an R package that you can interface the software so you could just write everything in R and you don't actually have to use the AS Rimmel software if you aren't familiar with it. Uh, really big data set. So um, my master's project was seven environments, a mapping population of 1500 individuals and six traits and uh augmented incomplete block design with replicated checks and the only way I could get it to run was an ASRML. I don't know if that answers your question, but uh, seven to 10,000 data points and a very complicated nested and mixed model. You know, you can, you can bog down jump in SAS with a, you know, three environment G by E uh, model could take the whole night or crash. If you don't have enough RAM, it'll, it'll just crash eventually uh, because the, uh, the identity matrix and everything are so complicated. I don't really know the underworkings of ASRML, but I think they make some assumptions in their, uh, their matrix algebra that gets around some of that. <laughs>
Okay. Um, let's let's get back going. Any other any other questions? Other resources recommend for someone who's complete novice to R. Uh, yeah, we did a workshop uh, back in uh, a few months ago, uh, and it should be on the NAPV website about how to how to do how to just code in R in general and the how R thinks and works. So you can go back and look at that. I hosted that as well. Um, and there's also some great books, like the R Cookbook is great. Just Google R Cookbook. And that's open, it should be free, open source. And you can learn a lot of things about, about implementing R. Um, Paul says, Crawley recommends Flinger Killeen tests for homogeneous various rather than Levine's. Do you have an opinion? Uh, I don't know. I know. <laughs> the homogen yeah, it's it's tough to say. And honestly, once you get into really complicated designs, uh, I mean, a statistician might tell me I'm I'm incorrect in saying this, but it's it becomes pretty complicated to even test homogeneity of variance um, because you have to, you know, thinking about what each population is is hard. It's hard to, you know, especially in like a split split plot. You know, what is the population? Is it the combination of all three factors and, and groups, or is it each subplot individually? Uh, yeah, Dennis, I'll give you, I'll send that again. Um, but yeah, for the homogeneity variance, uh, if you're in a very complicated design, I would, I would, again, I'm not a statistician. I, you know, I took a lot of stats courses, but I don't, I'm not an expert in the, underworkings of theory and everything. So yeah, I think you could easily run done it, uh, Paul. Uh, again, like we were talking about earlier, is it really necessary to run done it's when you can, you know, sorry, we got to find it when you can just look at this and easily tell which are it might be it might be better when you have something that's extremely complicated, but you know from your fissures anything that's that's that doesn't have an A in it is statistically different from the control. Um, but yeah, Dunnitz shouldn't be very hard to implement. I would just Google Dunnitz test in R, and it should come up. Yeah, there seems to be a lot of discussion around it. So if you're interested in running Dunnitz, uh, it looks like it's not very difficult. It looks like it's in the multi-comp. Here, I'll pull this over. So I just Googled this really quick, Dunnitz test. <clears throat> so when you do multi-comp compare, you can do it right here, it seems. And then you get your outputs. So if you're interested in doing Dunnets or two keys or any of these things, you know, they exist. You just have to, you know, two keys, HSD is right here. You can get <clears throat> your two keys values if you want to be more conservative. Uh, for a lot of graduate students, if you're trying to find significant differences, you should go with Fisher because it's the least conservative. Um, if you're trying to be super conservative to make selections on the most, uh, uh, the highest, you know, performing hybrid, maybe two keys is better. Uh, it's all up to interpretation and what you're looking to get out of your statistics. Okay, so let's get back into it. Um, we're going to get into some more complicated things. So we're going to work on, we're on th line 350 here. Uh, we're going to start talking about factorial experiments. So this kind of experiment allows researchers to study multiple independent variables in one experiment. You can also test the interactions between independent variables. Um, and essentially you can actually do factorials inside of RCBDs. And that's what we'll, we'll kind of be talking, we'll talk about here too. Um, and by definition, they consist of two or more different factors and comparisons are made between the main and interaction effects. There's advantages to factorials. 
uh, it, it economizes experimental resources, time and, and, and just cost and labor. Uh, it allows the estimate of each main effect with equal precision and it extends, and we'll, this changes when we get into models below this, and it extends the range of validity of conclusions in a convenient way. So there's some disadvantages as well. Uh, it, the model is increasingly complex in size and the cost of the experiment uh, can be, especially if you're in the early stages and you wanna test like seven different treatments or different kinds of treatments like fertilizer, row spacing, planting density, stand count, and you wanna look at all the interactions of those, it's, it can be you know, increasingly large if, and they you should usually do independent studies to begin, like independent CRDs of each one of those, I mean, RCBDs of those treatments to, to see which ones are actually important but before you go into uh, interactions and, and spending so much resources on these huge, these, these factorials can become very big experiments. Um, they're less precise estimates. Uh, from heterogeneity of factors, does the number of treatments increase? Uh, and larger standard errors compared to single factor experiments of similar size. So this can be overcome by blocking and confounding. And we're not gonna get into that in too much detail here, but just some, some notes for everyone. Okay, so we're gonna do another animal science based uh, data set here. So this is three breeds of uh, swine or pig fed three different diets to study average daily weight gain to maximize uh, economic importance or how quickly the, the, the pigs gain weight for, for sale. Uh, so we'll just execute this code to see to have the data. <coughs> uh, and we will go to the summary as well. So we can see we have three breeds of swine uh, and then we have not we have th three diets and we have three replicates. Uh, each of them have nine observations. Okay, so first thing we're going to do is so this is where we get into this idea of what is a uh, what is a, a population, um, and for this case we're just going to we're going to create population as the interaction between the breed and the diet. So that's what this is doing. We're pasting the breed with the, the diet to create a new column. So you can see now here in this groups column, we have the breed with diet one, the breed with diet two, and they all, all each one of these has three observations in them for the three replicates. Um, we can then visualize this so by saying X and Y of diet and Y is the average daily weight gain, <clears throat> we can do this thing in, in geometric box plots where we fill with the breed and it will actually make box plots at each diet for each breed. So this, doesn't, this is not using this information yet, but we'll use it in the future. Um, so you can see here that we have, you know, the land race has very different uh, variances depending on diet, uh, whereas the Duroc is more, more consistent and so forth. So just getting an idea of what your data looks like. So let's not get ahead of ourselves this time and let's... Okay, this is, I did, I apologize again, this needs to be below here. Okay, we're gonna do, I'm sorry. Uh, when you write these big long scripts, sometimes you mix things up. So let's just go ahead and test some homogeneity of variance off the start. Um, so we can test three different ways here. And this is the question of which one is the appropriate way. Um, sometimes it's easier to test them all. Uh, and in this case, they're all gonna be, they're all gonna be equal variance, so there's no issue, but we can test the, popu the breeds as populations, we can test the diets, homogeneity variance, and we can also test the combinations of all of those together because each one of those is technically its own population as well. Um, so if we run this, 
So we can see there's homogeneous variances between the, the breeds. There's homogeneous variance between the diets and there is homogeneous variance between the diet and breed combinations. Um, and again, like the comment earlier about uh, the, not using the Levine's test, it just depends on, you, I mean, if you run this in jump, you would get like five different tests out and you can pick which one you want to use. It's just, this is just for uh, a demonstration purposes. You should go read about the different tests and decide which one you want to use if you're really concerned with this, this test being uh, critical to your analysis. Um, okay, so let's, so RCB, I mean, factorials are really easy. You just put in breed. So we're running the model now. We're running uh, the, uh, the Remmel model. So we have average daily weight gain is equal to breed plus diet plus uh, breed colon diet, which that's the interaction term. This is how we define interactions in, in LME4 is with this colon. Um, and then we're also going to include our, our replicate as a random effect. Um, so we have two main effects, the interaction and a replicate. Okay. Okay, so we get a lot more information out now. Um, again, random effect uh, variants here. If we really were interested, we could run this all as random and we could get out the, uh, the variance decomposition of all of them to see which factors are, are, in, are explaining more variance than others. Um, and we'll do that later on so you can see it. But for, for this purpose, it's not as relevant. There's no nesting in this model. No, there's no nesting, Dennis. We'll talk about nesting later. Um, there's no need for nesting yet. Um, and nesting is interesting, and we'll we'll, we'll talk about some nested designs in a minute. Um, so, not a lot of it. There's not a lot to interpret in this. You can start seeing your your fixed effects and significance of specific things, like diet two is significant. If, uh, this is up for interpretation. Um, but it's better to just, you know, let's run our ANOVA again. So what do we get here? These are our fixed effects using Satterwaith methods. We can see that breed is significant p-value. We also have diet as a significant p-value. And we see that there is no significant interaction interactions occurring according to the model or the, the p-value. Um, Again, take these, I like to say, take the p-values with a grain of salt, always look at all of your terms, uh, both the variance components of them and then the, fit, the fitted model, and then also visualize the outputs to see if there is something. Just because the model says it's not significant doesn't mean that, significance doesn't mean that it's, that it's you know, actually important. Uh, and non-significance, there could still be important trends occurring in there. So look at your data and don't just follow the ANOVA table as the end all be all of, oh, it's not significant, so I'm going to delete this term from my model. Now, if you're overfitting, that's a different story, but you know we're not going to get into that. Okay, so this is where we can get into this question of, we're not going to run this right now, but so they, a lot of people say that running a parametric bootstrapping is the most efficient way to calculate p-values. So if you're, you know, thinking that this might need to be significant and you want a better, a more, you know, robust p-value, you could run a code such as this that is, I would not run this right now because it can, it, bootstraps take a long time. These are relatively short, but it could still take five or 10 minutes to run potentially. So if you want to run this in your own time and see what the p-values look like compared to here, you're welcome to. I'm pretty sure they don't change much. Um, but if you wanted to present robust p-values in your publication, I would recommend using either a Satterwaith method because it's the classical way that's been done for a very long time or the bootstrap um, 
and these things like the likelihood and the profile confidence intervals are not as robust to for p values. Okay. Next, let's look at the residuals and do the QQ plot. Okay, so again, uh, there is, you know, when we start to see dots kind of go outside of the, the confidence interval, we, we should start paying attention. Um, again, for this purposes, I'm not too terribly worried. If it was a huge spike out, we'd worry. Uh, and we'll run the Shapiro-Wilkes just to test this for normality. Data is normal. So we can move forward with that assumption. And we've already tested our homogeneous variances. So we can, we can move forward with uh, interpreting the results. So we're going to look at breed first here and get our LS beans out. Uh, and we'll just, we're just going to move forward and get to the graphs so we can look at them. Okay, so we can see here Yorkshire is the, if we're, if we're looking only breed, the Yorkshire gains the least amount of weight per day, whereas the land race significantly outperforms the Yorkshire, uh, but it does not significantly outperform the Duroc. But like I was just saying, when we talk about this, about actual real world, just because they're not significantly different, if you're a farmer and you can get this much more uh, weight out of growing a land race over a Duroc per day, this could be economically important in selecting land race over Duroc. Whereas if you just give them the statistics and say, oh, they're the same, they might, you know, that little bit of difference could be important to a farmer. Whereas for when we're just interpreting results for publications, we would just say not significant Duroc or land race is better than Yorkshire. Okay, moving on to the diets. We're just gonna kind of cruise through this because uh, it's basically the same code over and over just to explore the data. So we can see that now too, that diet two is the least performing diet across all the different, uh, so this would be the diet incorporating all of the breeds. And we can see that uh, diet three is the highest performing, but not statistically different from diet one. So for example, if diet one is way cheaper feed than diet three, it might be better to feed the pigs diet one because you save all that money on feed where this difference in weight gain won't make up for it in the final sale, right? So like these are things that you have to think about when you're actually discussing your outputs, not just that B, B and B are the same. Like there could be an economic reason behind why one could be picked over the other in terms of your data. And that's for your discussions, right? Okay, so even though this wasn't insignificant, let's take a look uh, at the LS means of the, the interaction. So breed times diet. You could also do a comma here uh, and it would work as well. Um, but we'll just keep it as an interaction. An interaction. Okay, and we are creating a slightly different graph here where we're using the lines instead of bars because of this, inter these are interaction plots, excuse me. And we're coloring by the breed. So this doesn't really look that great for publication purposes, in my opinion. So we can do a little bit of uh, ordering of the factors from, from lowest to highest. And this looks a lot better as far as visualization purposes go. So we can see diet two is the lowest for all of them. Diet one is medium and diet three. And we can see that they're, they're, this is consistent across all of the uh, the different, uh, and we should actually, sorry, I'm gonna fix this because there we go. So I added the uh, legend back in. So we can see that all the pigs, pig species or breeds uh, react the same to the diets. Uh, 
you know, land race is always the highest and it diet one and diet three make it better, bigger. Um, and this is a, so I just want to point out one thing. I'm going to go back here and show it to you um, that I forgot to bring up. So if you, if you want to, I don't recommend you do this, but you can do this if you know you're not for example, nesting, when you nest, you can't really get away with doing this as much, but you can take all of this and you could essentially write read star diet and LME4 knows to expand that to everything incorporated in that, that term. So if I, if I run this here, you can see that we, we, and we run this again we get all of the terms out because it knows that by saying the star, you want to incorporate breed, diet, and the interaction. Um, but I don't, I don't like to do that because it's harder for some people to interpret when you, when you, when you give this data to someone else, right. And you want them to re redo it or follow along with you, having it completely split explained out is much better Okay, so we're gonna move on. We're gonna kind of cruise forward. So we're gonna get into what Dennis was just talking about, uh, split plots and nesting designs. Um, these are advanced designs that uh, the number of treatments is significantly large and that cannot be easily implemented. So we have these things called main plots and then the main plots are split into smaller subplots. So the main plots have a, a treatment and then there are randomized subplot treatments uh, with the, the thought in mind that the precision of the measurements of the subplots and interaction with the main plots are always higher than the main plot. So you sacrifice main plot precision for subplot precision. So what this means is when you design these experiments, you should say, what is more important? For example, in our data set here, the hybrids are the main plot and the four levels of nitrogen are the subplot. So we're more interested in the differences in nitrogen than the differences in hybrids. So you need to think about that when you design your subplot. What is the, what is the most important question you're asking? Is it the nitrogen or is it the hybrid? So if it's the hybrid, you would switch this and have the nitrogen as the main plot and hybrids as the subplots. And we're not going to, yeah, if you have more questions about that, split plots are not easy to visualize. So please go and read about them if you're not familiar with them yet. Um, so we're just going to run this data to build the, to build the, uh, the data set. And we will visualize the data. So again, here we're filling by hybrid and we have nitrogen on the X and yield on the the Y, um, and we can see all the different uh, groupings here or populations. So we can see that LH74 has a huge something difference when you go from zero to 70 and it kind of stays the same. Whereas for example, A632 actually decreases when it goes past 140 and so forth. Whereas, uh, P3732 benefits from more and more nitrogen. Okay, so this is how to run a split plot design. So we have our yield as our response. We have random replication plus our main plot of nitrogen. I mean, our, oh, I need to fix this, this got, this got mixed up again. Okay, I will. I apologize for this again. I'll fix this and push it to the GitHub. So, and I'll explain why this needs to be fixed. Okay, so. The first interaction, the first treatment is hybrid, which is the main plot. And we then we have to have what is called an error term, uh, which is the interaction between replicate and hybrid. Uh, and this is how you 
correctly uh, test significance of, of the main plot. So in theory, this here is what you would call a nesting, uh, a nested factor. Um, and it will be more apparent in the, in the bigger ones, but a nested factor is when there's uh, an interaction, but there isn't two, two uh, main effects here. There are, um, but it's when it gets when we get into other examples, you'll see it in more detail. Um, but that's how you define nested in in this in LME four, and I'll ex it'll make a lot more sense when we get down to the uh, multi environment analysis. But so for example, if if we if we didn't have this term here that was gone, this would say that uh, replicate is nest, hybrids are nested in replicates because there's no hybrid term. Can you use percent in percent for nesting? Uh, I'm not sure, Dennis, I, I don't know. I'm, I haven't, I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of tricks uh, in LME4. Uh, I'm just trying to stick with the basic, most applicable designs that you would, there's hundreds of pages of the manual that you could dive through and you can change a lot of things in LME4 to this when you go through it. But um, this is the classical way you would, you would, you would just build a, a, uh, a split plot model. So yes, yeah, so again, this is the error term for the main for the main plot, and then you have your subplot and your interaction term of main plot and subplot, and the error term for these two is the residuals. So we don't need to uh, put any more terms into the model. Okay, so again, we have our variances. These are you know not really important because they're just error terms. Uh, we're not interested in the error terms for this experiment. Uh, if we run our ANOVA, so we can see the hybrid significantly significant air, uh, model term. Nitrogen is highly significant model term and the interaction says there's no significant interaction term. Um, <clears throat> so if we, we run this we can also run this as a classical ANOVA. So split plots were designed for classical analysis variance. And we can do that as well using the AOB. Uh, we just use this error, capital E error, and then put it around. Uh, this is fixed again. We run that and what we get essentially the same things here. Nitrogen is significant. We have, you know, high interaction not significant and we have a significant hybrid term. So you can do it either way if you want to. Um, this is the classical ANOVA approach, uh, whereas this is a REML based approach, which is what we're using up top here. And a mixed, a mixed model approach. Okay, so let's look at the, the residuals. They're a little weird. I think it's just, uh, so this is, uh, we're not gonna get into the details about the residuals here, but you know, there's obviously something going on in this data set. Uh, it's probably just the structure of the data, but this would, we would say this is, this might be alarming because of these stratifications of the residuals, um, but we're not gonna worry about it for the purposes of today. Um, but it could, it could mean that there's some underlying structure to your data that needs to be addressed. Uh, but anyways, if we run the normality test, we can see uh, that the, you know, we're, we're right on that edge of not normal data. So <laughs> keep that in mind when you're testing these things. Uh, it becomes more complicated when you're in the split plots because technically you're supposed to, I believe you're supposed to test normality of the main plot residuals and then subtract those from 
the subplot residuals and test normality on both parts. Um, these are concepts that are usually not, once you get this far into a stats course, they don't really discuss it as much. So um, again, if you really need to test these things, uh, you can start with these simple concepts and then re and then refer to someone who is more of an expert in these these model these assumption testing for these complicated models. So, uh, just for the sake of testing some homogeneous variances, we can test the the nitrogen populations that it is homogeneous, and also the hybrid populations are homogeneous. So that's good. Um, and let's just move forward with VLS means. Uh, first, we're going to do nitrogen because it is what we're most interested in. And we can visualize that. So we can see that we have a fairly big uh, confidence intervals in these, in these, uh, these yields. So that's kind of interesting. Um, you can interpret that how you would like. I'm not going to go, I'm not really sure what this data set It's probably just because this data set's so small and potentially randomly, randomly uh, created that this is occurring. Um, but anyways, so you can see the trends here. Zero is significantly the lowest. Uh, e is, is hot, is significantly higher. And then the 140 and the 200 are, and 210 are even hot, are the two highest producing ones. Um, so we do see that this comment that the results are misleading due to interaction. Um, and this, this is something to take into effect, into account. Um, I don't really think it has anything to do with, with the LS means, but uh, I haven't dived into any great detail on what, what they're what they're pointing at with this note. If we want to look at the main plots again, we'll, we'll kind of get the same uh, warning message. Um, and this would be a really interesting thing to, you know, I think one of the best ways to, to understand if you're getting the right, the right data out to is, is to take this and compare it to other softwares like JMP and SAS and see if what you're getting is the same. So you can, you know, you can be confident in, in, in using one software versus another. Um, So if we look at these as well, um, this could be these big these big confidence intervals have to has to be something to do with the uh, the way it's pulling them from the model, um, and I, I'd have to look more into that because this this the reason I say that is because um, these confidence intervals are are overlapping even though the significance are saying. The, the the letters are saying that they're they're supposed to be significantly different, meaning that the confidence bar shouldn't overlap. So um, that's some some details just to be aware of that. I didn't have a lot of time to dive into to why that's occurring with this right now, but um, if we're looking at the means specifically, though, we can see that this does this does follow a trend again where the LH74 is the greatest compared to the others, except for P3747. So uh, we're gonna pull out the interaction terms here, uh, which you can see here. And we can, we can model those in, in a graph to see what's going on. So even though the interaction term isn't doesn't seem to be significant by the p-values. There could be some, you know, some interesting things going on here. Um, you know, they're obviously LH74 is usually the biggest, but at 140, P3747 outperforms LH74. So, you know, don't. My my point here is to say that don't don't just 
throw out this data because the model says the p-value isn't significant. There could be something important here. Again, if this P3747 gives you 20 more bushels per acre, that could be really important to a farmer, um, especially if it's maximized there and then you lose, you know, you lose again at 210, you, it goes back down. So like, this could be important information. Whereas the LH74 is more stably uh, outperforming and high performing across all of the high, all the nitrogen treatments. So why would you, is this, is this bump in yield at 210 worth the cost of putting three times the amount of nitrogen on, right? Those are questions, those are discussions you can have about this data. Okay, so we're going to dive into this a little bit further, uh, a little bit more complicated. So this is what's called a split-split plot design. Um, and so essentially below the subplot can be subdivided into even smaller plots. And it follows the same concept where the, uh, the, the, the sub subplot has the highest accuracy in with uh, sa the sacrifice to the subplot and the main plot accuracy. So whatever your most important treatment is should be in your sub subplot. Um, so we'll run this data and we'll just get a visualization here. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, we're, we'll have it up on the website, on the YouTube as well for people to reference. Um, okay, so when we visualize this, one thing, a note, uh, we are using this comment called facet wrap and this allows us to split the graph into the two hybrids, which is the main plot. And then we have the, uh, the subplot as the x-axis and the sub subplot of planting density as the, the actual filled data or color of the filled data. So I, I, I apologize if we're, I'm just trying to speed up a little bit for time. What we're looking at here is we're looking at the influence of planting density on hybrid corn yield. And the experiment is laid out as a split split design with the hybrids as the main plot. We have two hybrids uh, subdivided into row spacing as the subplots. And then this, the subplots are subdivided as planting density as plants per acre. Um, and that's how the experiment is laid out. Uh, so that's what this is showing here. Here's the two, the two uh, hybrids at the top. And then we have the row spacings as the subplots. And then within the subplots, the box plots are the planting densities. So we can see here P3740 has really radical differences based on planting densities at 12 inch row spacings. But when you put it at 25 inch row spacings, the planting densities increase, but, or the, the yield increases, but they're not this drastic change as you can see here. Um, so, okay, let's get into, we're just gonna jump straight into the, uh, the model here. Um, so, Yes, this is a very long model and it's pretty complicated, but uh, once you learn the structure, it's really not, not that bad. Just, you just have to think it through a little bit. So we start with bushels per acre, uh, random replicate term, plus the main plot of hybrid, plus the hybrid error term, which is random replicate by hybrid interaction. We then have our subplot of row spacing plus the interaction of hybrid by row spacing, again here indicated by the colon, plus the random term of replicate uh, hybrid row spacing interaction. So this is the, the error term that is used for testing these two, these two uh, model parameters um, in a classical ANOVA specifically. And then we finally have the interaction of planting density, or we have the, the sub subplot of planting density, plus the interaction of hybrid with planting density, plus the interaction of row spacing with planting density, plus the three-way interaction of hybrid row spacing and planting density. 
okay, woof, that was hard, right? That's a lot of information. So um, this is why, you know, we're just, you always want to just type it all out instead of using these codes to like extrapolate. So you can see what's going on. So just remember, always start with the, the highest order. So replicate, main plot, main plot, error term, subplot, main plot, subplot interaction, uh, error term, sub subplot, the two sub subplot times main plot interaction, subplot times sub subplot interaction, and then the main plot, subplot, sub subplot interaction. So don't, don't worry if this is not, this is confusing. Whenever I do this, I have to sit down and think about it for, you know, an hour before I, I'm ready to really uh, implement this, this design. Okay, so we're getting a message here that says boundary singular. Um, so what this is saying is, is that the error term here is essentially zero, or it's so close to the boundary that it's uh, it's not useful. Um, so you could potentially remove this from the model if you're running Reml, but uh, if you're gonna run classical ANOVA, you still need that in to test your F statistic. Um, you have to divide the mean squares using this term. So if you're gonna do the classical approach, you still you still need to have this in your model. Okay, let's just run the ANOVA thing. And so it, I, I'm gonna show this here because you can change this if you really want to. You can change this to type one, type two, or type three. And you, so for example, we're gonna do Kenward Rogers here just, just for the fun of it instead of Satterwaith. Um, and we can get out our, essentially our ANOVA table. So what do we have here? We have saying the main plot is significant. We have the subplot is significant. The sub subplot is significant and only the row spacing by planting density subplot by sub subplot interaction is significant. So these other interactions aren't necessarily significant. So you would wanna kind of explore these, th these four areas first before you spend time on the others. Uh, we're going to show them all really quickly just so you, so we can visualize them here. Again, if you wanted more uh, robust p-values, you could try running this uh, parametric bootstrap. Don't do it now or you're going to get behind. Uh, we can run the QQ plots. Everything looks pretty good. Um, again, this is the way I would approach it. If you want to check the theory to see if the residual of the entire model is the correct way to do it. Um, it's, it's still a kind of a vague question sometimes to me if this is the absolutely appropriate way, but this is the way that most people would do it is they would check the residual of the entire model. Um, and we're just gonna, we're just gonna leave it there because the homogeneity variance question becomes very, very confusing as well. Uh, and I don't want to give false information on how to uh, approach that. I would talk to a statistician to really get that answer. Okay, so we'll do the LSDs again of the, the, uh, the main plot, and we're gonna get this same, this same warning. Um, but we can see here that, you know, the we have significant differences between the two hybrids, which our model showed. Um, doesn't seem like much, but it could be, it might be enough uh, to cause statistical significant differences. Um, there is not a huge amount of difference between the two hybrids though, as far as that goes. Uh, let's look at the subplot of row spacing. And again, we can see that the the 12 inch row spacing actually outperformed the 25 inch row spacing, taking the experiment as a whole. Uh, let's look at the sub subplot of planting density. Uh, so we can see here that regardless of the other two 
and this is the one we're most interested in, that the the two thousand the twenty thousand plants per acre was the best performing, but it was not significantly different from the sixteen hundred, the sixteen thousand, uh, and the twelve thousand was statistically less, um, which should make sense in, in corn high density, more plants, more yield. Uh, let's look at the hybrid row spacing interaction. Even though this wasn't significant, we'll look at it anyways. Uh, pretty interpretable. P3740 always outperforms the other hybrid at either row spacing. Um, and that could be interpreted from the other graph, from that, from just the hybrid uh, term. Hybrid by planting density, again, we get the uh, the same result. P seven seven three seven four P three seven four zero is is better in, in all treatments for planting density. Um, and then we also can do the row spacing by planting density. So this is the significant term, uh, but we can see that the twelve the twelve intro spacing always outperformed the 25 intro spacing as far as that that term is con concerned um, and just just for the fun of it we can do the three-way interaction and see that uh, by each hybrid there is you know these specific interactions are trends occurring okay so I kind of cruised through split split plot because the uh, it's a complicated experimental design. It's not used a ton, but it, I think it's used pretty consistently in some applications. Um, and the most important part of this is is learning how to to fit the model, right? You need to you need to put this in correctly or else your your terms that you're getting out are not going to be, a pro you're not going to get the right uh, data back unless you build the model correctly. Okay, is there any questions about factorials, split plots, split, split, plot, split, split pot, plots before we move on to the last section? Um, did I lose anybody there? Okay, I don't see any anybody saying anything, so we're going to move on. So we're going to go to the last section uh, for today. Um, this is the part, Dennis, yes. You have a question, Dennis? Oh, okay. I, did I, are you saying yes because I, did I lose you in the split plots? <laughs> Yeah, don't be uh, again. Don't be, don't don't get scared of the the analysis. I mean, there's these are very classical approaches that have been around for a long time and have, you know, very concrete like ANOVA approaches behind them. So you can always fall back on the ANOVA and the those those approaches if you really want to. You can use. Uh, the old school SAS where you use the the H test and tell which parameters need to be tested which with which uh, error terms. Um, if you want to go back and do that to to test to see that the uh, that these models in LME four are consistent with those. I'm not showing them here because. Um, we did that when I when I learned how to do these things. We we ran it in SAS, we ran it in Jump, we ran it in L and in, in R, and we we compared them. So I know that these are should be the the appropriate implementations in R um, through my courses and statistics. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we're not gonna get into that. <laughs> Sorry, Erica. That's uh. That's there's papers. Uh, on that, and they're actually not the the designs. 
it's more about uh, the design of the experiment than the actual the the code. The code isn't as complicated as you would think. But I would look up some of uh, the classical SAS papers on augmented incomplete block designs. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about that at the end. I have, I have some resources for you for that um, because I, I did do that during my master's research. So, um, so okay, we're, we're gonna do you know, a classical plant breeding multi-environment kind of analysis here. We're just gonna kind of touch on it. We're not gonna go into huge detail about it, um, but you'll get, you'll get the important information out of it that as a breeder that I would think is important out of this data. So uh, there's some links here about the data set, genomes to field, and also the link to the actual full data set from Seth Murray's lab, uh, if you'd like to use it. And there's a citation for it. So this is that, that data that we needed to download. Um, and I will try to send that one more time to you guys, just so you have it. Okay, so there's the, oh, I sent that the, let me send that to everyone. So this should be the data uh, for the for this part. If you can get it to install, um, I'm sorry that it didn't. It might not work as easily as yes, Dennis. This is for the uh, multi environment. Okay. So regardless, if you just follow along with me, um, cause I have it in, I have it here. So I have it in my, in already. Um, so I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna revert the name to G2F because when I first loaded it in from my computer before I put it into the Google drive, I was, I loaded it in and called it G2F. So I'm just converting the name that it's saved as in the file back to what I wrote the code as. That's all this is doing. Uh, and we're making a few of the factor of the, the columns factors for grouping purposes. Okay, so there's a lot of information going on in this, this data set. So if you wanna play around with it, I gave you guys a lot of extra uh, information. So uh, the main thing is, is there's this test function, there's this test parameter, and there's three different tests in here. So those are what we're considering the environments. In College Station, we have, uh, we plant an er uh, optimal planting irrigated trial. We, we plant a, uh, an optimal planting drought trial, and we, and we also plant a late planted uh, irrigation trial. So that's what the tests are. And we technically consider those separate environments in our, in our, Lab and that in Dr. Murray's lab because uh, they 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 are technically different environments as far as management and and time of the year. Um, we'll be using the replication column, and we're also going to use the pedigree column, which is the hybrids. But just so you know, there's there's a lot of data in here. There's days to anthesis, days to silking, plant height. Uh, this this is ear height. This is flag leaf height. This is stand count, lodging, plot weight, moisture, test weight, yield, yield moisture, bushels per acre. So we're going to be using just bushels per acre today, but if you wanna play around with all these other response terms, feel free to. Um, and the data is, is publicly available. So if you, wanna, if you wanna play with it, feel free to do that. I think there's even multiple more years of data available on, on Cyverse now as well. Okay, let me... Get the chat back up. Um, yeah, let me see if I can. 
Let me see really quick if I can drop the, the CSV to you guys. Oh, I can put the CSV in the Google Drive really quick. Give me one second. Thanks, that, thanks for that idea, Dennis. Okay. Okay, yeah, I'll, where did it go? Okay, I'm gonna put, so bear with me guys, thanks. This is a this is always the fun part of a workshop where we have Okay, here you go guys. If you wanna use the uh, this file from the Google Drive, this should be the CSV um, that you can download. Thanks for that idea, Dennis. Um, and if you look at this fun, you can, you can put this in here, uh, where you would put in your, your path, as we discussed before, uh, double backslashes is how I like to do my paths. And then the CS 17 G2F data .csv. Uh, and if you execute, we would, we would get rid of, we don't need this or, whoops. Just jumped. Let's go back down here. Okay, I'll give everybody a second to try and get that data if you want it. We got we got about thirty minutes left, uh, but we'll should have plenty of time to finish what we're going to talk about here. Okay, Dennis got to work. Anybody else? Good, thumbs up. Okay, well, we'll move forward. Uh, again, you can follow along and then return to this if you would like to get the data uh, pull, pulled in. Um, so we're gonna just load in the data here. Make sure that again, that you you comment or you comment out this section if you're loading it in with the CSV um, and name the CSV G2F. So we're just going to do box plots of the tests. Uh, let me open this and just show you guys it really quick. So again, we have all of these, we have tests here and those are what we're considering. They're all in the same location they're all at the same farm, but they're different tests. So those are what we're considering an environment in our case here. Uh, we have the replicates, uh, the pedigrees are the most informative section here. Um, and then we have all of these data, this data you can play with if you want to later, but we're going to stick with the bushels per acre for yield. Uh, and we also have some range and row, which is this, the planting locations in the field. And we use this to do spatial variance uh, partitioning uh, to take, take into account the different, the, the large planting trials in, in, in combination with the blocks of the RCBD. Um, okay, so again, we have our three tests. Uh, the two earlier plantings, the optimal plantings are pretty consistent. Uh, and we can see the late planting, the yield is much lower. And this is pretty common trend in, in late planting maize in, in Texas. Uh, we can look at this and we can also see we have some, this is useful because we can see we have some some zeros, which is gonna really skew our data. So we need to, we need to get rid of those. They should just be missing. We don't want, we don't really want zeros in the data set. They have too high of leverage. Um, we'd rather just ignore them as missing data. Um, so here we're making a histogram. Uh, of the different trials to get a better view. And again, we can see we have some really big, you know, zeros out here. 
So this is a simple loop where I'm going through and I'm looking at the, the values of bushels per acre. And if it's less than 50 bushels per acre, I'm setting it to missing. Um, just as a quick cleanup for this purpose, you, more cleanup would probably be necessary if this was for you know, a publication. We still have some, some, some smaller values here, um, but I know from my personal experience with this data, I know that there are varieties in this trial that, that perform at this level. So we're gonna leave them in, uh, in the data set. They might be, again, you might wanna consider removing these as well because they're just not representative of the whole, the whole population as a whole, but the, the distribution should be good enough that you can, you can keep those in. Okay, so whenever you do a multi-environment uh, analysis, you always wanna do individual environments first and look at them. So we're going to do one of the environments. We're not going to spend time on all three. And we're going to do the G2FE, which is the optimal planted uh, irrigated environment. Uh, and the first thing we're going to do is we're going to run a completely random model. So we're going to say bushels per acre equals rep plus pedigree plus range and row. And again, we have essentially our blocking term for uh, for the RCBD, and then we have range and row, which are base are kind of like a, a Latin square where you're taking into account the rows and columns of the field uh, variance to 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 account for spatial variation. Uh, this is just something that we do in and we did in Dr. Murray's lab as it was just part of almost all of our analysis. Okay, so we get that out uh, and we get our variance terms here. So really interesting, our, our rep term actually is, is almost zero, which is, in, and this is potentially because we, we are accounting for the variance efficiently with the range in row, uh, but we'll leave it in for now. Uh, it doesn't make a big difference. Um, So, sorry, I was thinking of something really quickly. Uh, so the way we pull out the variance component, so we talked about this earlier that you can pull out the, the random effects, but we didn't really need to because we didn't really care about them. But here we, we care because uh, to, for what I'm gonna show now is to calculate repeatability or heritability, you need the variance components. So you have to do fully random models and then use these values to to calculate heritability and repeatability. So we use this function called var core, and that pulls out the variance correlation matrix here. Uh, and we just, we convert it into a data frame. And then what we're doing here is uh, we are, we're dividing, let me just run this and show it to you really quick. So you can see it. Okay, so this is what you get out of there. Uh, you get GRP, which is the groups, you get the variance co uh, component and you get the standard deviation. Um, and then we can, what we're doing next is we are dividing each of the variance components by the sum of the variance components to get the percent variation because this is also important. Uh, this is how we like to present uh, variant percent variation. So we can see in the individual environment, the pedigree is explaining the largest portion of the variance, which is good. That's what we want. It's our most important term. Uh, it's what we're after is the difference in the pedigrees. Uh, we have some good partitioning of range and row effects. Uh, and our residual error is, is, is decently small at only 20%. Um, so this is, we like to present this a lot in breeding publications. This is, this is how we interpret our models. A lot of times if we're, if we're doing a good job partitioning the, the variance components. So if we want to calculate 
heritability, or in this case, it's repeatability because there's no population structure. These are all just random hybrids. Uh, it's calculated the same way, but we're going to pull the pedigree, the variance component of the pedigree. We're going to pull the variance component of the residual, and then we're going to calculate how many reps there are. Knowing the data, we could just set this to two because I know there's two reps. And we can do the heritability such repeatability equation, which is variance of pedigree divided by the sum of variance pedigree plus variance residual divided by the number of reps. And when we do that, I wrote this nice little code that says, this is the wrong one, but it should be G2FE. Um, but it says G2FE bushel per acre repeatability is 86.66%. That's really good. Um, so that's, that's nice to see, uh, especially for yield. Again, this is not heritability. Yield heritability is probably going to be lower than this if you're in a, in a population, but this is, this is a really, really, you know, really high for yield. So um, this is a really good value. That's, that's something to be excited about when we're, when we're analyzing this data for yield. Um, so now we could run it with pedigree as, so that's about all we would do there for that information. We would then run the model with pedigree as fixed, uh, keeping everything else random. Okay, yeah, so Dennis, repeatability is uh, inherent, it's, it's essentially like heritability, but it's, it's explaining how repeatable the trait is across the replicates. So the higher the repeatability is, the more it's, it's kind of consistent with heritability. So you want it to be more repeatable and by being more repeatable, it's more selectable. So when you have a really, really low repeatability or really low heritability, that essentially means it's really hard to select uh, the trait. And this is a breeding, this is a breeding, uh, a breeding kind of, a plant breeding kind of topic. So uh, a lot of, a lot of people present heritability when they do mapping populations. And then you present repeatability if you're testing like GWAS populations or, or hybrid trials where there's no genetic relationship, there's no population structure. So that's, it's, it's. It's hard. To, you have to go and read. There's a lot of papers that present it. It's it's a pretty common value that's used in most breeding breeding groups. Um, did that help? Cool. Okay. So we yeah we ran the model as fully fixed. Pedigrees highly significant, which we would expect because of the super high percent variation. Um, and there's like 300, there's like 300, 250 pedigrees in here. So there's gotta be some statistical differences. Okay. So we're not going to run this bottom part. Please comment this out before you run anything. So if you highlight it and press, or just delete it, whatever you wanna do. But if you hold control shift and press C, you can comment out or just add hashtags in front of everything. This will take all night. So please don't don't run it. This is where I'm saying, where I was talking about how the, uh, the connecting letters takes forever on these big populations, but we can still run LS means. It doesn't take that long. Um, this takes like two or three minutes and we're just gonna, we're gonna sit for a second. Does anybody have any questions while we let this, let this process This is a kind of an important step, so we're gonna we're gonna kind of let it do its thing for a minute. No? Okay. Okay, so what we're doing here while we wait for this to run is we are calculating the LS means of the pedigrees. And the reason we're doing this is because we want to, uh, we want actual yield, we want actual yield estimates as like the intercept plus 
the different uh, the different blues and glup terms. Uh, and then we want to select, we're going to order it in decreasing because we want to select the top 10 hybrids. For example, if this is a breeding application, right? This would be something we'd be interested in. What are the top 10 individuals to move forward? Uh, and this is just, some of this is just, uh, you know, this is just me testing the timing of the, the process to give you an, ex an idea of how long it's, how long it takes to run. Um, for example, this, again, this in jump would take, you know, a minute. And this is probably going to take a few minutes here. And I think it's a, yeah, about five minutes. Um, hopefully it will finish. Any questions? Explain repeatable. Oh, I did that. Okay. Do you get into mega environment analysis, GGE plots? Uh, yeah, you, that's stability type stuff. I'm not going to get into that. Um, yeah, we're, we're just kind of talking more about, uh, experimental design and that kind of thing. GGE plots and AMI plots and all those things are, yeah, you, you can do all that as well. Uh, you know, and uh, Wilkinson, I think is one of them too, but that's beyond what we're gonna cover kind of here. That's more of a topic of uh, phenotypic stability and plasticity, which may be beyond the scope of what we're kind of doing here. Okay, cool. So it finished. Okay, so it took uh, 180 seconds, so three minutes to run that. That's what that elapsed time is in seconds. Uh, so not bad. Um, and then we can get out uh, the top 10 hybrids which is, you know, if we were trying to select and move things forward, this would be a way to do that. Uh, this is just for some applications in breeding to show you. Um, but for here, for example, since this is a field trial, the top three are all replicated check, are all uh, commercial checks. Uh, five and six are commercial checks. And we have a uh, B73 by one of our top Texas lines, which is really for our program would be really exciting to see that the best non-check line is a cross between B73 and one of the best uh, producing Texas A&M maize hybrids that has uh, ex it's more exotic germplasm. I think 779 is from Argentina or something. Uh, then we see some of the other uh, entries into the, the, the G2F experiment. Okay, so that would be kind of some interpretation there. Um, and then you could, also, you could also take this information, right? This, these LS means, if this was a, uh, you know, a, a, a biparental population and you could use this, this data for your QTL mapping. Um, LH195 is a stiff stock. I, I don't know. It's all over the board. You'd have to check into the G2F experiment. TX779, uh, it's kind of difficult to say. Dr. Murray would, is probably shaking his head at me right now. But um, B73 is stiff stock. And then TX779 is somewhere in between. It's a tropical germplasm, more on the stiff stock side than the non stiff stock side. But it's you know, it's kind of its own group. It's not an iodent either. It's kind of just in its own area. Um, but I mean, 6469, Rev, HR20, those are, you know, commercial stiff stock checks, I think. Uh, and then these are all just different, lots of, G2F has like 250 hybrids all crossed for analysis of uh, genome to phenome uh, variants. Okay, we only got a few more, few more minutes, so we're gonna push through here. 
so we can if we so we would do this kind of analysis for all three environments uh, and then we would combine those environments and do what's called a, a multi-environment trial analysis and uh, this is very easy um, to do there's just a couple slight differences so this is where we're doing nesting so by doing rep times test what we're saying is, is we're test we're, we're nesting rep and test um, because there's there's no rep term on its own it's only the interaction um, but we do have a test term here so this is how you can say that the, the reps are unique to the environment and you usually always want to do this because rep one in environment one is not the same as rep one in environment two um, so you need to keep them unique to the environments by doing this nesting we can then have a pedigree term uh, the test term the interaction term pedigree by test and then again we have our two spatial variance components nested within the tests again because they're unique to the test and we can run this uh, this one should take a second and we get out a bunch of variance components again uh, so we can see here that the the test is has a lot of variance so the the bushels per acre is highly influenced by which test it's in uh, which makes sense and we saw that pretty evident in those box plots at the beginning. So let's just run the random, uh, pulling out the random covariant correlations and such and calculating percent variation again, uh, similar to before. So we can see that the test or the environment explains 80% of the variance in bushels per acre and pedigree explains the next highest of 10%. So th those are good signs. Uh, we have 3% G by E, or genotype by environment interaction. Uh, this isn't very high, but it's still significant enough to be like, okay, we, we, should, we should be aware of this and potentially look into this more. Um, so we can again calculate repeatability uh, based on an entry means basis, where we now bring in the G by E term um, so we have pedigree divided by pedigree plus variance of G by E divided by the number of locations, which is three, or the number of environments, however you want to do that, plus the residual variance divided by the number of reps times the number of locations. And this is a very common equation that you can find in, in most uh, breeding text, textbooks. And again, we can see that the repeatability is about 85% across all of the environments for bushels per acre, which is again, very, very high, but this could also be because um, these are uh, high performing hybrids or um, it's all, it also just could be because the environments were pretty stable. Okay, so we'll do this last part here where we set pedigree as fixed uh, and run it now that we've, and, and again, you would want to go in and, and test all of your assumptions and all and things in here as well, but we're just, for the sake of time, we're just going to kind of hit on some of the, the bigger important areas here. Um, I think this might be yeah, so based on how long it, it took to do the last one, we can start this one and run it, um, but it's probably going to take about six minutes or so. Uh, but we can see here, again, pedigree highly significant. And uh, so we can go, we can go into picking, p pulling out pedigrees that are important. Um, this, yeah, this would, if we had more time, we could, ex we can evaluate, we could expand this to evaluate G by E and, and the plasticity of the different, and by plasticity, I mean how much the phenotype changes from one environment to the next. Uh, more stable, less placid phenotypes are more desirable um, for hybrids that go across, you know, multiple states and environments. Uh, whereas some hybrids can, you know, be more 
tailored to individual environments that they do best in. So you can do that kind of analysis too. But the main point of these takeaways is a lot of us as breeders, we, we want to take this, this blues or blups data and, and do a downstream analysis, right? We want to, we want to stick it into uh, a, you know, a stability analysis, or we want to stick it into a QTL analysis or a GWAS or, or a multitude of other things. So this is how you would get that data that you could then go on and do uh, those other analysis with the blues and the blups. Um, so I, we're gonna, I think we're gonna stop there because uh, this is, we'll turn this on and see if it goes. It's probably gonna take about six minutes, but um, that's all I've got for today. Um, I'm happy to take any questions about any of the material. I uh, will we'll try to get this pushed back up to the GitHub really soon. Um, anybody have any questions? Is anybody still there? You can raise your hand if you'd like to uh, ask a verbal question too. Thank you, Travis. Yeah. And uh, remember to, you know, if you've never taken a, an experimental design course, I would look into it. It's useful. Um, there's different experimental design courses you can take. So I took two in school. I took one in, uh, I took one based off of this book where we learned how to do old school calculating everything by hand like mean square, sum of squares, F statistic. And then I also took a, a more applied uh, statistical course where we, we focused on model implementation and, and outputs rather than the mathematical theory behind the experimental designs. Um, yeah, there's the, the channel. And I, one last caveat, again, I'm not a statistician. So uh, if I misspoke or something was incorrect here, I, I greatly would appreciate the comments too, if anybody has them about how we could do some of this stuff better and, and teaching the community the correct way to do this if there was a, an, an incorrect uh, process done here. So maybe everybody can join me in thanking you, Dr. Anderson, for a very insightful workshop. And I posted the link the, to the National Association of Plant Breeders YouTube channel where this webinar will be posted. I'm not sure that a, a link will get sent out to everyone, but you can find that in the, the chat. So please check the channel and keep the tabs on it and even select to like and follow the channel and you should get a notification that this video is, is shared. Thank you. Uh, so question, so the book is called Design of Experiments for Agriculture and the Natural Sciences. Um, it's by Reza Hoshmand, H-O-S-H-M-A-N-D. Um, you can check it out. Uh, I can't comment if it's the best book ever, but you know, I learned, I seem to learn pretty well from it. Some people love it, some people hate it. Um, there's other books out there too. Uh, I don't have them on hand, but there's definitely more books probably, like I was saying earlier, much more tailored to uh, software rather than uh, doing things by hand, uh, you know? So this is, there could be books like, this is how you do this in Jump. This is how you do this in SAS. There's probably someone doing some of this in R. Uh, I just Google, Google it and, or go to the library and see what you can find. There should be a lot of these things at your libraries at the school. And that, again, oh. th this will be where you'll learn, these will be where you learn how to design the experiments too. So we didn't really touch on, you know, designing and randomizing and doing all that correctly. If you if you need to learn how to do that, definitely check, check in on, an experimental design textbook because that's very critical to 
to this whole process. If you don't do that right at the beginning, your your interpretation isn't going to be use isn't going to be appropriate. Cool. Uh, okay. Any other questions? Lots of thank yous. You're welcome, everyone. It was a pleasure. Thanks for coming. Thanks for staying for uh, the whole three hours. I didn't think it was going to be this long, but sometimes it just just happens that way. Okay, well, thank you very much. We'll have the posting available soon and hope everybody else has a good rest of the week. Thank you. Thank you guys. Bye, everybody. Have a great, have a great day.